Hey, this is uh, my ascension and my awakening story from um, 1979 through a mushroom experience um, when I was 21 years old, nearly 40 years ago now. I turned 60 last February. Um, a lot of it for me was really just difficult to tell a serious uh, story about it. it. It was just what I had experienced and in, in, in then living here in this, this reality um, was just so far apart I couldn't bridge the gap. Until about a year and a half ago, um, about January 2017, my meditation started to really extend beyond the usual results. i had been meditating for almost 20 some years, practically 30. Um, and I had kind of plateaued out a long time ago. And that was just, and I, I guess that was all I asked of it too, but uh, I was as far as it went. And it sure didn't help with, with having a, <clears throat> a deeper grasp of um, my ascension and my awakening. At the time, we didn't, I didn't even use that language. But, to me, it was a spiritual rebirth, um, the real rebirth. Uh, not just going down the river and getting some water thrown on your head or whatever. Um, it, you know, if you didn't leave your body, you didn't have the real experience. But, uh, or something like that. Um, we had been picking mushrooms for about, you know, years. Ever since we were 16 and then had our driver's license, as soon as it started raining in the fall, we'd bomb over there to the coast to go mush mushroom picking. And uh, by the time I was about 20, in the year when I was 21, when this happened, um, the mushroom fields had just gotten so crowded and overrun by pickers, it was almost a battle, you know, a gun battle was going on between the farmers and the property owners and the pickers. I mean, it's pretty bad. They were Passes was just getting mowed over. There'd be hundreds of people out there in a pasture. It'd get turned to mud in hours. And it was just everywhere like that. So I headed to the coast further. Went over by the Lepinic uh, Peninsula. In a place called Hump Tulips. And that year me and a friend had hitchhiked. And uh, we brought a tent. We were just going to camp out for the season. And... and dig it, you know, but uh, rains didn't come, and after about a week, Dave went home, and then I started running out of money about the second week, <clears throat> but the salmon were spawning, and I was catching salmon out of the, out of the uh, creeks, you know, they kind of spawn, and they start to die, and they just lay around, and kind of just walk out there and grab them, get a stick and grab them, but uh, that's what I was doing, and about half starving. <laughs> there was some hungry times, but I wasn't going home. And it took about three weeks, and finally the rains came. And um, they started that morning, and by late afternoon, mushrooms were starting to come up. And I was out there picking in this field where I was camped out. And all of a sudden, from kind of out of nowhere, this hippie couple, this older hippie couple showed up. And uh, we got to talking, and... and uh, we were getting mushrooms, and oh, they had these cabins up on top of the hill right above the pasture. It was kind of a little group of them up there. They had about, I don't know, five or six cabins, and there's families with kids, couples without kids, uh, single people. Oh, there was a group of people up there, about five or six cabins. They didn't have no electricity or running water. They had to haul that in. And there was a trail from the pasture up to them that was real steep. You had to use a rope kind of pull yourself along. But uh, that night, I was over there, ate dinner and ate mushrooms, and I probably ate about 70 or 80, but I didn't really feel them. Um, not like I should have on 70 or 80, and they were fresh, you know, but I was thinking, well, maybe they're too fresh. And chance to really mature and, and uh, get more, you know, stronger. So anyway, the next morning, I was counting what I had left. It was 149. And I was going to go down to the store and get a Sunday paper from Sunday morning. 
And uh, I figured since uh, those that 70 or 80 really were about half strings, I'd just go ahead and eat what I had left. It was 149 mushrooms. I ate them all. And it was way more than I'd ever eaten before. I'd probably eaten close to 100, 90, 100 around there. I don't think I'd ever eaten over 100. And you get a pretty strong high when you're eating 70 or 80. Uh, most of you probably do 30 or 40. But uh, um, as I got down to the, the, the tent, my tent had blown down in the night. And so I was propping it back up and had all that kind of exertion going, my blood pumping, and got it all done. It was starting to rain a little bit, just jizzling a little bit. And uh, I got inside the tent. I could feel the mushrooms starting to kick in. They were coming on pretty good. And uh, I was just sitting there in my tent, out there kind of out in the nature of it all. The cool dampness, rainy weather, and but kind of warm, you know, I was perfectly warm and cozy and dry in my tent. And uh, I was really appreciating that fact and, and being able to live like that. Um, I was always kind of an anti-materialist and, and I had lost a girlfriend to who, a guy who made more money and uh, she was my first true love. And it broke my heart hard. It was my first broken heart. I was 20 years old the year before. It. We split up. She left me for somebody else to make more money and more security. And my wild ass. I don't blame her. But uh, I knew I just was having trouble really fitting in that role. And uh, was realizing it was kind of a farce. We really didn't need a large salary to be able to buy a big old house with a two-car garage and keep up with the Joneses. And, you know, at this time of my life, you know, I'm 21 years old, that's really all I'm thinking about. It's all secular things. Everything's secular. I don't really have a spiritual life. I was raised Catholic, and I went through the whole rigmarole, catechism, <coughs> first communion, and works. But uh, by the time I was 13, I didn't, couldn't care less and didn't get a thing out of it. Except maybe doubt, definitely some hefty skepticism anyway, um, and didn't really care. I just didn't really care. I was far into my teenage years, and it was the end of the hippie era, and that's the way we lived. It was like life's a party. Let's have a blast. We're young, live while you can, and body down. The whole works, you know. Uh, totally for the moment. Didn't give a shit. Um, and I'd have, you know, a pretty strong history of psychedelic use. I started when I was 15 with acid, and uh, right away I noticed everybody would eat, like, we'd get this window pane acid for like two bucks. You could split it four ways, most people, but to me I always felt like that was like half. And I could take a whole window pane and be just right. Those four, and it was strong acid. And it was helping me peek through some things. Um, you know, reality. Realizing there was way more to life than than what it meant to I. Um, but I really didn't put a spiritual context to it. It was just more of a mind thing. But it was definitely noticeable, and it definitely had my attention. What was this? Kind of like just barely being able to notice that there was a veil, let alone really peek behind it. But yeah, life was a trip, and there's way more to it than what it seemed like. And then with the mushrooms, you know, it was just kind of, you know, way different high in influence. And I definitely felt uh, a presence of something else, someone else, like, you know, the spirit of the mushrooms. Which later on I started to realize were like these little elf things. But uh, with acid, I couldn't feel that. When I take a lot of acid kind of just be out by myself. I just kind of feel my own soul. I really didn't feel a presence of anything else. And with peyote use, when I lived with uh, natives up there in Wyoming, um, used to, you know, had a lot of it peyote ceremonies there while I was there for 20 years. You know, sometimes I'd go, well, I used to at least go every year, but uh, um, 
sometimes three or four times a year. Sometimes I'd go three or four years without one, too. You know? It just depends how much I had to integrate from the last ceremony. And when it was time to go to the next ceremony, it would just like kind of show up in your face. And I knew it would be time. I knew it was time to go. The way it always started from the very beginning, the very first meeting I ever went to, it just jumped in my face and said, hey, you need to come. Come on. Uncle Howard showing up that way, telling me and Bill, come on, we need your help. And away we went. Um, and I had, you know, there's a more informal use where they call it tying drum, and you can tie the water drum that you use in the peyote ceremony and practice singing songs and do peyote. It's, it's not a real uh, uh, peyote meeting ceremony, but it's done ceremonially, and but it's way looser. You know, it's it's more of a social thing too for close friends or family. Um, did a lot of those, and. Uh, Uncle Howard was really pushing me all the time, but just take these great big giant doses all night long until you're peeking your guts out and barely talk, can't talk. God, I remember that first night. Me and JR and Uncle Howard and Edward, all four of us, sat up all night with that old man, the peyote. And those old men, man, they, they take it a lot. And they kept passing me, and I kept taking it. And uh, by sunrise, uh, Richard, the one that found me up in the mountains and brought me down to live with these guys. Um, Edward was his brother. He'd been over next door and showed up in the truck or something. But anyway, he'd come through that front door and all that sunshine from the sunrise just blasting through and I'm just like, <sighs> and he's like, well, do you feel holy yet? And I just, I couldn't even talk. I was just like, <laughs> but later on when he was taking me home, boy, I sure couldn't shut up then. But, oh man, that was a Great night. That was, was fun the best. But th these are all typical highs, you know, that can kind of lead to some really deep experiences and, and beautiful experiences and, and mind-opening experiences. But what happened in the tent that day was, was like no other. I've tried to repeat it. I've tried hard. And that's kind of where the... That's where the... Uh, the AI that runs the uh, the simulation, the holographic reality that we were in. I encountered that in, in 1980 at the very end of a whole series of mushroom experiences trying to recreate my ascension and awakening experience. And it just, I couldn't get, it wasn't, it didn't happen. It was, it was a one-time thing, and I realize that now. Um, even if I were to have something similar happen again, it wouldn't be the same experience. It would be a totally different experience of a totally different reality, but still the same. Um, I'm sitting there in that tent, noticing how I feel and how content I am with this, this little pup tent. That's it, you know. I, and uh, I realized how hopeless it was going to be to find a woman who could appreciate a limited pup tent. But uh, that's what I did. I yelled out that doorway up to the sky. Where is she, God? Where is my blonde-haired, blue-eyed babe that can understand this? And uh, I started laughing. The mushrooms are kicking in. And uh, I'm laughing hard, like where, you know, you get to laughs and you can't hardly stop. And you just feel like sometimes you're going to die because you can't breathe, because you can't quit laughing. I mean, you just, oh. And uh, the mushrooms are really well known for that. They're more than, I think, all the other psychedelics. They do it the hardest. And uh, for a long time, for quite a few years now, I'd always seen that part of the mushroom high where you laugh real hard like that has the soul coming through. The soul was expressing its, you know, probably its most basic nature, just the hilarity of, you know, everything being just so far beyond with anything we ever imagined, anything we were ever taught, and pretty much anything we can try to conceive of from this reality. 
it's just so far beyond. But, uh, you know, I've had some astral experiences and journeys and stuff where I can feel that separation. But what happened that day was probably my very first and it was way beyond any kind of astral plane. Astral planes always still seem to have that sense of this reality. Kind of like in, in a dream way. But dreams do too. Dreams have this sense of being this reality. And when you're in the dream, unless you go lucid, then you realize you're dreaming and it's different. And astral is kind of like that. It's kind of being lucid. But things are pretty much based on what this reality contains. It doesn't really go much beyond it. I mean, there is things like, you know, just the whole experience of being there and how you kind of traverse it. You don't really go anywhere. It's like everything just comes to you. But it's not really like that. It's just you. You're just there. Sometimes you can kind of find your way through some places, but I don't know how much imagination that is. It might just be, you know, because there's a big mixture. There's a big mixture between imagination and what we're actually experiencing. What we're experiencing and perceiving can be different sometimes. Um, there's no, there's no fine line between them. They usually, like we have here, <clears throat> or, you know, a fine line. It's more like a, a definite line. What we're experiencing, what we imagine, it, you know, it's to, totally different things here. They merge more when we're kind of separated from our brain. And I think that's what happened with the mushrooms. I know that's what happened. It wasn't so much an, an astral experience where I felt like I left my body, but the way I immediately identified it and knew it to be was was my mind had separated from my brain. But I hadn't left my body. I hadn't gone anywhere. I was there laughing. And I was letting it come because I always believe that's a good thing, like the soul's coming through. And I always just let that, you know, I laughed or come as much as possible. It's one of the best things in the, at that point, it was, at that point in my life, and my experience with mushrooms, it was one of the best parts of the whole mushroom high. And I think there was a lot, and I knew there was a lot more to it than just the laughter. There was a lot more that I couldn't really understand or perceive, but I knew it was there. And uh, this time, the laughter, you know, it was, uh, you know, it seemed like regular kind of laughter in a way where you just ha 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 ha. And you just laugh them one ha ha thing after the other. Um, steadily. And you can't hardly stop. But somewhere, they just kept getting bigger and deeper. You know, at some point, I just like broke through in this big, huge ha. Ah! And it was just as large as the cosmos. It was just cosmic. Ha. Ah! It went out to the whole universe. And I could feel that's what it did. I mean, I just knew that's where it went. And then it came right back in. And it's like this huge cosmic sob. And it just... And then again, ah! And it was just... It just kept doing this huge... Sob back in. It was just all on this cosmic level. And I was just... Boom, boom, boom. And next thing I knew, it was like... My mind was crystal clear. More clear than I'd ever really realized... But I hadn't realized it yet. It was just the first, my first thought, thing that hit my. It, I go, what happened? Did I lose? My, did I laugh myself out of my eye? What the hell happened? I, I could not feel the mushrooms. The mushroom high was completely gone, and that was the first thing I noticed. And I was like, what the hell happened? And as soon as I started thinking these questions like that, it's like, it's like I already understood the answer. It's like you've separated your mind from the brain, and. You're still here because I can feel it. I can feel it like I kind of felt like I was standing there in the tent, though, instead of sitting cross like and rocking back and forth like I had been. And uh, 
But that tent is too small to stand up in. I don't know. But I didn't feel like I left my body. But my mind was definitely separated from my brain. And right away you realized the precision. There's just absolutely zero doubt. You, if somebody asks you how many stars there are in the universe, you know. And instantly before the question could even be all the way formed. It was like you knew everything. It was just the perfection is just, oh my God. It's so far beyond this reality of any kind of idea of perfection that we have here. We, even the most perfect thing that exists in this reality, it, it doesn't even come close. This perfection is just like, you know, it's divine. We're, you recognize it right away, it's divinity. And... It was kind of like at that point, you know, I'm, you know, I'm just realizing all these things almost, you know, instantaneously. I'm like, what the fuck happened? Well, you know, and then, oh my God, my brain separated my, from my mind. And there's this level of consciousness and, and thought ability that's just so far beyond my norm. I'm like, you know, like, what the hell's going on? And you realize this is this God. It's the only thing it can be. There's no absolute, there's just zero doubt. You know what's up. And you recognize it. It's not only that you know because of some ability to know. You recognize it. You've known it from before. You recognize it. We all do. And it's like the beauty of the perfection and the perfect I mean the precision of oh Ah, oh, the love and the, and, and the sense of coming home. You just, uh, I think I just started screaming, Lord, Lord, Lord. And I, you know, I wasn't into Jesus too much after my whole little Catholic bout. I had, you know, I, I guess I basically figured he was kind of a spiritual master at least and, and a real cool dude for that. But whether he was the son of God and the savior of mankind, I, you know, I, the verdict was still out. I really didn't think about it much. But <clears throat> I was screaming Lord. And it wasn't like Jesus, it was the Christ. And as I'm screaming, it was like he didn't die and go to heaven. And my chest just opened up and I became happy. And this whole level of like this infinite, eternal, heavenly reality and God's presence and the Christ and the earth and all of mankind coming together, all our souls eventually coming together to form the, the, the Christ. That's what the, the Christ, the Christ is all the union of the souls on earth. And it builds to a certain point. And it's almost like the mother earth gives birth to it. It's her child. It's her son. And I've definitely seen it as male, female. But I don't know if it really is. But I did see the Christ as male and the earth female. And it's like the son grew until it became her husband. It became mature. and They formed a union. And that's when I went on to God. That's when I went on to the Godhead. And we're part of this. We are it. And on a very individual basis, we are that. And there's really like nobody else there but us. Just you're, you're the one. You're the, you're the Christ head. You're the Godhead. You're, or, uh, when I get into the AI story, maybe we'll explain some of that a little bit. How If you just start thinking in billions, everything's billions. You have billions of lifetimes and there's billions of versions of every one of those lifetimes. And there's billions of other universes and realities that contain, you know, all these billions of lifetimes and billions of versions. Well, over, it's just endless. And it's in the billions. It's just, but it's finite. It has a creation point. This ain't eternal. It's not infinite. It has a creation point and it has an ending. And it's finite. This uh, reality, this 
universe and all of these billions of universes like it. They were created. Because they were created, they have an ending and they have cycles that they go through that. And there's recordings, old ancient recordings and newer ones. Not exactly mainstream academics, but it's out there. The information's out there. Now, Earth and this reality and this universe go to different ages. Um, at this time, I'm not, you know, I'm totally, I don't know any of these things. I don't know anything about Eastern religions or not, nothing. I know, nothing. I know zero. But I'm recognizing this for what it is. Because it's almost like from the past almost. But it didn't seem like it didn't seem like I'd ever left. It seemed like I'd always been there. And I was in. I couldn't go nowhere. I was the place. I was heaven. I was the dimension that contained all this. That's what I was. And there was a sense of being in it. Being in that dimension and being the dimension itself simultaneously. I felt my presence in there, but it came, the place that I was in opened up from my chest and I became it. And then, um, a lot of what starts to happen is, is similar to what near death experiences describe. Um, you know, there was none of that going into the light or the tunnel or anything. And sometimes right now, uh, things I've learned to this point, I, I think that's probably a bad idea. Avoid the tunnel. We'll talk about that later too. Um, I need to try to get this done. It's not going to be very fast. Um, we're still recording. Hope it saves it. Um, great. That's possible. Now there's a, you know, there was a level of knowing and receiving information and recognizing things that way beyond my knowledge, way beyond my experience, way my, you know, even my wildest imagination had never gone here about what God and what man's kind union was spiritually with each other, the earth, God, all of it. You know, I didn't, the, the first thing I realized, and it's such a huge full realization, you kind of go on and on and on about it, but it was an instantaneous realization. It was just the full thing. All we had to do was die and be born. It's all birthright. Um, the life we lead, what happens, good or bad, what we do or don't do, all of it, it is zilch. It don't matter shit. You, everything goes. Everyone goes. And it's not by our own deeds and our own knowledge or our own faith and belief. It's by the grace of God. But it includes everything. And we're, by the grace, we're transformed and brought on board. And even if you can't get you through the front door, it's going to get you through the back. Our lives are perfectly orchestrated with that same precision that's on that level. Our lives have that exact same precision the events of our lives and how uh, the events lead from one thing to another it's like a whole chain of orchestrated events throughout every minute of our lives from day one to the last dying breath but at the same time you know we do get to express our free will as we go through it it, it just it just gets morphed into the even when we make mistakes of the right choices there's still guiding us to where God needs us to be to get us where he wants us to be. To get us in. To open us up. To ascend. And when wake up. The first thing I'm realizing is, you know, it's like, this ain't nothing like what I've been taught. And, and you know, my religious background, Catholic uh, upbringing, To the point where this was, that's what I was, I was seeing myself being spiritually reborn. What they'd always talked about, I'd heard them talking about, you know, be reborn in this spirit and, and all that. This was it for, to me. This was the real spiritual rebirth. And maybe what they were doing in the river, you know, or splashing a little water out of a tub on their head, um, ain't it. 
<laughs> it ain't it. You ain't leaving the body. It ain't it. Or leaving your brain. Oh. And, you know, it's like I, I'm realizing and I'm feeling and I'm going through this. And at the same time, it's just like, you know, I'm, I'm at my own normal level of knowledge and, and understanding. I can the questions come up immediately. I'm here with God, and I get my chance to ask questions. I'm like, hey, what was, what's up with all the suffering? That was the first thing to come to my mind. You know, ever since I was 16, 17 years old, and really started to feel the adult pain of existence. You know, the loneliness. And, and there's just those kind of dark nights of the soul where you just, the level of emotional pain from just existing is really bad sometimes. I used to, you know, I used to question God for it. What was the point of feeling this much pain? And really, in my mind, even at 16, 17 years old, I used to feel like there just had to be something really rotten at the core of the universe for this this much pain to exist, this much suffering. You know? And I hadn't even done none of mine yet. I was 16, 17 years old. I didn't have nothing really go wrong. I'm just talking about my existence. Existence on the earth for everybody. It was, it was painful. And I was wondering why. You know, what's up with this stuff? Before I can even form the question, this is what I want to ask. And before I can even form it, I see it already myself for the first time. 